this gives me a go live button. Let's see. Does this actually go live? If you can see me, please comment. Oh, hey, it looks actually we're actually. Uh, we may this may actually be live. Let's let's see. It looks like we're live. <laughs> hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. And yeah, we're having technical difficulties this morning, so I'm sorry uh, this evening, whatever time of day it is. Um, so I'm sorry for the uh, the delay. <laughs> For some reason, the computer was just going boncos on me. Um, but we got it up and running, I think. Um, please let me know if you can see me and hear me. <laughs> there you are. Hey, Pit Snipe, thank you. Um, so welcome to the shop. We're doing our monthly Q&A. We do this every month on whichever uh, Tuesday ends in a teen. So it is currently the 18th, but so uh, we're doing that. Um, Events coming up. Um, if you ever want to know what is happening in the woodworking world or things that I'm going to be doing, um, then tune into whatever live is on in the first few minutes of it. I go through events. Um, we have first thing. We just came back from Washington D.C. Had a meet with the Patina group out there. Um, two weekends on uh, the 29th, I'm going to be down in Orlando, Florida. There's an MWTCA meet down there. Uh, let's see. August 6th, Garfield Farms, which is just like an hour away from me here in Illinois. Uh, that is another MWTCA tool meet. Then September 1st through the 2nd. This is the big one. September 1st through the 2nd is Handworks. It is two days, completely all about hand tools. It's an entire town set aside for hand tools. Um, and all the big names are going to be there. Rex and I are actually going to be doing a meetup at 3 o'clock at the brew house on that Friday. Um, so come on out and say hi to Rex and myself. Um, Friday? Yeah, Friday. Um, yeah, and uh, let's see. The next one is September 10th is Frankfurt, Illinois. September 16th is Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, and then September 28th through the 30th is in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, that last one is the MWTCA National Meet. It is one of the largest tool sales in the entire world. Um, and it's two days of just buying and selling tools. Lots of fun. Um, so I'll be at all of those. And if you if you want to see those events or others, there are links down in the description. And in the live, I've actually pinned um, a link to handtoolfinder.com. Um, it is my site that I have all the information I have. And I'm, I'm redoing it now. So please go and take a look at it and let me know how it comes out because I'm trying to make it a little easier to get around. One of the sections on there is events. And I have a listing on there of all the events I know of in the antique hand tool world. Not just the ones I'm going to, but um, all, they're all over the place. There's a, and you can sort them by location, like uh, um, Australia and uh, the UK and uh, Europe um, and Canada and then all of the states. Um, so, yeah, lots of things going on. Um, <laughs> so take a look at that and let me know how it goes. Um, so if you have any questions, throw those in the chats. We're going to get to them. If you are watching this recorded, then go down in the description down below and I have all of the questions asked with timestamps beside them. Uh, my wife is frantically collecting questions and putting timestamps on them. So um, thank you, Sarah. You're doing mm. a lot of work. She doesn't like Q&As because she uh, has to do a lot of them and uh, we keep her busy. So. <laughs> if you have questions, throw those in the chat and uh, we'll, uh, we'll answer as many of them as we can tonight. No, I'm just listening to the list of how much you're gone, and I'm like... <laughs> I love you. Yeah, COVID was kind of nice with Yeah, that. where are my weekend. trinkets when you go to all these things? I'm not getting any souvenirs from this. I, I, it's dangerous for me to bring you sharp things. They don't have to be sharp things. <laughs> they can be blingy. <laughs> <laughs> blingy. Let's, let's see if there's diamonds at the next tool sale. And don't you bring me... Sharpening stones? Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. So, um, let's jump this off. We have, do we have Can you chat? volume up on James's mic? You sh should be up. Yep. Are you on? Check your mic. Make sure. With all our tech issues. Yeah, let me just make sure I'm on because we've been having problems with it. <laughs> yeah, I'm on. Um, hey, y'all, I'm James Wright, and it's a little bit on the quiet side. Let me see how that ear. works. Just want to make sure I don't cut off. There we go. Um, so what question we got? Okay, hang on. Um, well, we had a super chat in the midst of technical difficulties, and that was Alan Lewis, who asked, 
I was wondering if you had the John Walters book on Stanley Tools with the type study in the back. Um, I don't actually have that one. I have looked at it and read it, but I do not have it. Um, I actually got that one from my library back when I first got into hand tools. Um, but yeah, no, I don't have that one. Maybe someday. My library is growing. <laughs> Do you have a mom joke ready? I, yeah. Or should I jump on to the next one? What are you going to jump on to? i got to read either way. A good point. <laughs> Give me two seconds. <laughs> what do you call a Mexican man leaving a hospital? What? Manuel. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. I like that one. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I've gotten better at trying to curate some throughout the week. What's next? I'm going to start yelling at you, not the cons. Um, Warren Munn says, finally, yes, I know it's about time, getting around to painting the miter saw. How did you go about painting yours? I put a couple of coats of undercoat, one top coat, planning on two more than clear coat. Um, I use uh, one coat of um, self-etching primer, and then I have usually two or three coats of my Rust-Oleum metallic blue, and I don't do a top coat on it. Um, I haven't seen much need for it. Um, so yeah, that's all I do. Spray paint right out of the can and call it good. Um, I just make sure it fully cures before putting the final coat on it. Um, the other ones I might hot coat a little bit, but not much. So, yeah. What's next? Um, Mobius Flight asked, I have a Miller's Falls number two auger drill bit depth gauge. I know how the Stanley works, but I am not sure how the Miller's Falls works. Any idea I could I, send? Oops, sorry. I could send a link showing a picture if you need it. I have never, I'm trying to remember that one. So there's a bunch of different designs for auger bit depth stops. Miller's Falls auger bit depth stop. Um, but I don't think I've used that one. No, I have not used that one. So, sorry, I would love to show you it, but uh, I don't have it. Um, yeah, that might make a fun video, though, sometime. I'll see if, see if I can get one. But, uh, no, I haven't played with it, so, sorry. <laughs> What's next? Fitznipe asks, if you're only going to have one panel saw, should you get a rip or cross cut? For the panel saw, I generally say get a cross cut saw. Um, Generally, a cross-cut saw has less downsides when ripping than a rip-cut saw has when cross-cutting. Um, because if you are cross-cutting with a rip saw, excuse me, if you are cross-cutting with a rip saw, you're going to get bad tear out on the back where it pushes chunks out, and you're going to get splinters. Um, and it's not going to be that much faster. However, if you are using a cross-cut saw on a ripping cut, you're not going to be getting splinters. You're going to be getting a nice clean cut. It's just going to be going slower. So the downside is it cuts slower. Um, and so I would rather get a nicer cut and go a little slower. Now if I'm working on smaller saws like the size of a dovetail, I would rather have a rip cut um, cross cutting than have a cross cut saw rip cutting for little teeth like dovetail cuts. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a different size. But for a panel saw, if you have one or the other, get a cross cut. Something around a, uh, usually like a eight PPI, something around that range. What's next? Um, Yan asked, how much would I feel the difference in upgrading to a replacement blade to get the most out of my Stanley number no. five jack as a primary daily user? Oh, I've and generally you won't feel much. Um, uh, honestly, upgrading the iron really isn't going to give you that big of an event. I mean, a lot of people really, really like it because it makes you feel good. It makes you warm inside. And um, Are you going to get a better cut? No. You can get the exact same cut one or the other. Um, the, the, the difference is the operating envelope. Um, with a, a thinner Stanley blade, it's, you've got to get it set up right. It's got to be a clean, smooth iron. It's got to be well sharpened. But that operating envelope of how dull can it get 
um, and the woods you can work on really cleanly with it is, is a smaller window. With a thicker iron, that window is a little bit bigger. Um, and so you can, you can go a little bit duller before you start getting chatter. You can do slightly harder woods before you get more chatter. Um, but not that much. So it, it's really not that big a deal. Um, you, you've really got to be working with planes for a long time before you can feel the difference between a really nice plane and an old Stanley iron. Um, the, the biggest difference is how long they will last. Um, a, a good new end iron will last significantly longer than an old Stanley iron. Um, and if you want to see that, I did a video testing out a whole bunch of plain irons. Uh, I want to say it was like 20 some different ones. And I'm going to be having another one here coming soon because i got a couple more to add to it. Um, really got to get down and make that. Um, and you can, you can see an obvious difference. Is it a huge difference? No. Um, but it is, it is significant. So, yeah. What's next? Um, John Hayes asks, I just came across someone making traditional wooden shields. He uses harsh chemicals for pigment paints and skin glue. Have you worked with harsh chemicals? Um, it depends on what you classify as harsh chemicals. Um, yeah, I've worked with a lot of weird acids and other things like that in industry. Um, but yeah, some people consider boiled linseed oil a harsh chemi chemical. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean... Yeah, there's lots of things, especially historically. Uh, we think now of, oh, I want to use natural things like they used to use. Well, no, they used to use some really astringent, horrible things to work with, and people died using them. Um, <laughs> and that, uh, yeah, it, it's a little different. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's some weird things in use out there. But, yeah, if you have some specific thing you want me to talk about, I'd be glad to. But everyone's different. Everyone has different uh, things that they consider harsh and evil and perfectly usable. What's next? Uh, you know, it's that dihydrogen, what is it? Di dihydrogen monoxide. monoxide. I'm yeah. tired tonight, y'all. <laughs> um, evil stuff. Well, when people like, are like, all that, I'm like, so is cyanide. Anyways. <laughs> Dr. Khan had a question. If you were to create a travel or go kit of tools to have ready at a moment's notice for demonstration and or practical use, what would you include? Half inch chisel, a mallet, a number four, and a, um, a cross cut panel saw. Um, those four things you can do pretty much anything. Um, there's, there's very few things that you can't do with those four items. Um, everything else is just making it easier. I mean, really, if you really want to take it down to a half-inch chisel is the bare minimum. Everything else is making it easier. Um, but, yeah, those four things would be the, the, the basic. I mean, the next thing I would probably get would be a, a good rasp and file, um, like a four in hand. Um, and then I would get into drilling holes, um, brace and bits. Um, and then maybe a carcass saw or sash saw. Um, but yeah, actually, I, I did a video on this a while ago, Beginner's Hand Tools, uh, where I actually went through the most important tools in the shop and then went down from there. Uh, one of the things I don't list in my tools is a screwdriver and a hammer. Um, I, I used to have a regular claw hammer in the shop, and it disappeared a few years ago, and I never noticed it was gone. Um, it's just something I never use. And screwdrivers... I, I don't normally list them because everyone's got screwdrivers, so why would I list, oh, you need to go get a screwdriver because you probably have a screwdriver already. <laughs> so, yeah. What's next? Um, let's see. Dad Gamut says, hey, so glad to see you. Can you give us an update on your solar power? Thank you. Oh, yeah, it's been going great. Um, actually, this December, it will be three years. Three years? Yeah, three years. Mm -hmm. um, last year we made 7% more electricity than we used. Um, so we spent, we've been spending $11 a month to stay connected to the grid. And from day one, we've been saving electricity. We have another, um, what, seven years on the loan? And I'm not going to pay it off any faster because the interest rate on it was 3%. And that's better than inflation. So we're going to leave it alone. <laughs> <laughs> There's no reason to pay that one off quicker. Um, 
so yeah, I've been I've been loving it. Um, but our, our loan payment was less than our electrical bill and has stayed the same. And our electrical bill will, would have gone up. So yeah, I'm, I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. Um, we're because right, I'm, I'm producing about seven percent more than I use annually, and so we were thinking it might be a good reason to get like a, a plug-in hybrid, um, and then use the, the battery on that because it's free electricity. Maybe in a full electric and use that. Free gas. <laughs> yeah, if you don't want to see it, I've got several videos of, of putting up the the panels, and then I had a one-year review looking back at it. What's next? One second. Um, Steven Singleton asks, "Could you give a quick over? Bleh, could you give a quick overview on how to use the tool that sets <clears throat> teeth on a saw?" Uh, a saw set. <laughs> the tool. There are hundreds of types of saw sets, and I'm trying to think because I just bought a book on saw sets. Um, and I don't have it right here, do I? Is it right over here? Yeah. No, it's somewhere else. Um, yeah, there are hundreds of them. And they get as simple as, let me grab this one. This thing. <laughs> uh, this is completely out of focus. Unfocus, there we go. This is a saw set. This is actually made by Distin. Um, and so you put it in there and it's a wrench and teak, teak and you can tweak the teeth to be um, slightly out. Um, and then they get very complicated and very simple. I've got uh, this one here. This is a hammer saw set. Um, this one actually goes in a dog hole and you can crank it down can you, in. Um, focus it. That would help. There you go. Then you can put the saw in here and then hit it with a hammer and it sets the teeth. Um, basically all you're doing is you're having a wrench so you have the saw, comes, the saw comes in from on top, or from the side, however you want it. And there is something that sticks out and holds the side of the, the plate up here. And then an anvil comes over and will push the tooth to one side or the other, depending upon the way it's constructed. Um, and you're bending the tooth a little bit, tiny, tiny little bit. Um, and most of the time, you're actually pushing the tooth, and it looks like it goes out and comes back. And it looks like it comes right back to where it was, but it actually is sticking out just a little bit more. Um, and... Uh, yeah, there's a lots of different designs. I want to do a video here soon showing saw setting and a couple different styles. I just haven't. Um, it's, it's one I've just had to sit down and record and haven't had a chance to do it yet. So, coming soon. What's next? Uh, <clears throat> Unicycle2993 said, I just got an old Stanley number no. 7. What's my cheapest option for flattening the sole? Sandpaper on float glass? Question mark. Yes. Um, now, let me, let me do this. When you're talking about a big jointer like that, you don't need to go crazy flattening it. Um, they can be, uh, yeah, you can, you can drive yourself bonkers flattening one of those. Um, and even the most horrible out of, out of work sole usually won't take, if it's done correctly, it won't take you more than five, six minutes, maybe 10 at most. Um, but there are people who will spend entire days trying to chase perfect flatness and you're never going to get it because that plane is very flexible and surprisingly flexible and it's going to drive you bonkers. So don't, don't worry about going crazy on it. Um, but the best way to do it is to go to your big box store and find your belt sanders and get a belt sander belt, the biggest one you can, with the, with the biggest teeth. So something like a 36 grit or something like that would be phenomenal. Um, usually I don't want to go any, any smaller than like 50 grit. 50 grit would be um, pretty fine for the first pass. And put it on a piece of flat float glass, tape one end down, and run the plane five or six times. Look at the sole and see where it's scratching. If you put a, a Sharpie on there, you can see more. But the only thing that's important on the plane, the only thing that's important is the toe, the mouth, and the heel. You don't need to worry about anything in here as long as it's higher. Um, and so if, if you're getting scratch marks across the toe and all the way across the mouth and all the way across the heel, then this is flat. Um, even if there's some gullies in the middle, they don't matter. It doesn't, doesn't change a thing in how it functions. Um, so just go until you get those scratches. Um, and on the mouth, it's the front of the mouth and front of the iron that matters and back of the iron really doesn't matter that much. Um, so yeah, start with that. 
And then uh, I would usually then jump to like 100 grit and I usually leave it at 100 grit. If I really want to go fancy, I might go up to like a 200 grit, um, but 100 grit's more than enough for any steel body. Um, don't need to really work it down more than that. So yeah, that's what I do. What's next? Matt says, hi James, I struggled to plane the sides of a board square to the faces. Currently having to work without a bench and clamping the board between two by fours. Thoughts? Yeah, um, it, it can be difficult, especially when the, the board wants to, to tip on you. Um, here, grab the little thinner. So when the board is up here and if you're clamping it between two blocks like this, um, it's gonna have a tendency to want to, to wobble unless you really clamp it down. Um, and really getting a good, clean, true edge on it is, is difficult if the board has any wobble. Um, so coming up with a method of holding that is, is really important. Um, if, you're, if your board's holding it in place, are letting it wobble around, find something different, find a different clamping method. Um, I actually like to use um, squeeze clamps, if I can get one free here, Whoop. and clamp them onto different things. Um, I found this head actually works really well to clamp up against, so I put it on the the side of the table like this and then I put one on the other side either holding either clamping the board itself or holding another board in place to lock it against um, I've done that a few times um, but keeping it from wobbling is, is very important then the next thing is planing it um, some people will tell you use the lateral adjuster and that works it takes off more material one way than the other but I find that to be kind of like the nuclear option uh, most of the time you get really close to it and it's just tipping out one way or the other. Or it may tip out one direction at one point on the board and another point on the board it's the other direction. So you have to be looking at that and realize one side you need to take off more material over here and at the other end you need to take more, more, more material on the other side. So what you want to do is actually move the plane over. The plane has a good amount of weight. So if you need to take off more material on this side, have the plane stick over a little bit so it naturally wants to lean. And then when you get to the other point on the board where it's twisting the other way, have it slide over the other side so it's twisting the other direction. Um, and just merely moving the plane over to one side or the other is going to make it want to tip off the board and take more weight on more material on one side or the other. Um, so, yeah. I guess that's the best advice I can get. If you want something specific, send me some pictures. I'll be glad to take a look at it. What's next? Um, James Carey asked, what was your most satisfying hand tool project? Most satisfying. Um, that's kind of hard to answer. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I love every project. I, it's very rare that I don't have a project that's really... I mean, most satisfying was probably the pentagonal bowl because I finally got that thing done. It took six years to conquer it and make it happen. Um, I don't know how many attempts at it and finally got one that worked. Um, that was incredibly satisfying to be done with. Um, dining room table, I love that one because it's just, I use it every day and I love it. Uh, just, it's a beautiful table to eat at. Um, and every time I look at it, I think about it. Um, I don't know, the bench? I like the bench. I use the bench all the time. I don't know, there's, there's so many projects. You that didn't kind of give your rote answer. What? Like the last one I made? It, yeah. Or the What's one you're currently working on? The one yeah. I'm currently working on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mouthed it while you were in, <laughs> and you didn't say that. It's like, ah, oh, come on. What's uh, next? Christian Kosterman asked, "Hi, I've just brought bought some plans from your shop, but as far as I can see, there are only the PDFs, but not the SketchUp files. Have I missed something?" Um, there should be a link in the PDF to the SketchUp. Um, however, I just found out that apparently the plans for the bench um, didn't have that in them. And so I've got to rework them and, and include that. Um, otherwise, send me an email and I will, um, I'll send those out. Because um, someone just um, brought that up to my attention today or yesterday. And uh, yeah, it's kind of surprising. I thought they had, but I've been selling the plans for five years and no one's mentioned that. <laughs> but yeah, the SketchUp file, um, it should be linked in the in the in the PDF file, so you can pull that up. What's Someone next? knows you as Leaky Felder. <laughs> Who knows me as Leaky Felder? <laughs> Polly and Prague. Ah, that's that is my uh, that's my uh, um, uh, Dungeons and Dragons name. 
I know. That's why I was like, yeah. they my, know you. My belly girth name. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see, David G. Someone knows me from back when. <laughs> <laughs> I have those pictures. Um, okay, David G. asked, if you could go back in time and learn from one woodworker, who would it be and why? Um, any one woodworker? Oh, I couldn't do one woodworker. I'd get to know them all. Um, green and Green, I would love to go back. The, the whole arts and crafts movement is, is really, really kind of cool. Um, I, I think that would be a good one. Um, I know. I, I know a lot of people would love to go back to like early American, um, east East Coast makers, but they really don't interest me as much. Um, I like a little bit simpler kind of flowing. Um, yeah, probably green and green. I think that 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 shop would be a really cool one to, to go to. So yeah. What's there next? There you go. I don't know why it's not. Um, what's his face? Rex. <laughs> Rex Kruger. <laughs> I've been in his shop. I haven't been in his new shop. <laughs> uh, let's see. Ross Sanctuary asked, how do you put the spring back in place on a 572.24700 scroll saw? Scroll saw? Um, I'm just reading it. The spring back. I don't know what you're talking about. All right. Yeah. We need clarification on that one. <laughs> uh, Thomas Lamb, can you possibly damage a diamond plate by applying too much pressure? I'm using a trend diamond plate to flatten a chisel back, but even at 300 grit, it doesn't cut. Um, yes, you can. Um, because the, especially with trend, I've, I've had really, really mixed results from trend. Um, some of them are very durable and some of them aren't, but when you really get to coarse diamonds, coarse diamond plates don't last long. Um, even for the best ones on the market will wear out relatively quickly. Um, and you have to understand how they're made. It's basically you have all these diamonds that are held into um, usually a chrome um, surface and they're actually like chunk rocks in metal. Um, and when they're big, when you have big chunks in there, you hit them with the iron, they can ch chip out. Um, and big, coarse rocks tend to wear off very quickly. You actually knock all the diamonds off of the plate. Whereas really fine stones can last you a lifetime or two because the bits are so small that they're very, very hard to knock out. Um, so yeah, coarse plates wear out much, much faster. Um, if, if, you, um, if you're gonna replace a plate on a set, you're, you're replacing your coarse ones. The fine ones you, you may never ever replace. Um, but yes, putting too much pressure on it will knock them out. Um, with diamonds, you don't need much pressure at all. Usually the weight of the tool and just a little bit from your finger is all you need. Um, yeah. But if you're, if you're flattening, uh, diamonds are not for removing material. Um, don't, don't use them for, for, for flattening. If something is out of true, the first thing you should take them to is sandpaper. Um, a really coarse grain sandpaper. If I'm really flattening something, I'm going to something like a, like a 30 or 50 grit sandpaper. Really, really, really heavy stuff. Um, and grind it off with that. And then once it's flat and true from the sandpaper, then bring it over the diamond plates. The diamond plates clean it up and, and hone it and smooth it out. Um, don't use them for really grinding it down. Um, unless you're working on like small places like the edge of an iron or whatnot. Um, I, I generally don't flatten that much on diamonds. Uh, but yes, you can wear them out by pushing too hard. So going back to the spring with the scroll, so the scroll saw doesn't normally have a spring in it? Um, oh, I'm trying to figure out what they mean by a scroll saw. Are you talking like a, like a coping saw or a fret saw or a turning saw? Um, because Scroll saw is usually intended for a power tool with a blade that goes up and down in a frame. Um, um, unless you're talking about like a foot-powered scroll saw, but mine oh. doesn't have a spring. 
Someone just said Google says that it's a model of a Sears 15 inch scroll saw sander. Oh, yeah, then I wouldn't know. That's not something I have. No, I have a powered scroll saw, but I've never used it. Bought it a long time ago and it's been sitting there unused. <laughs> but it's a cheap one from like, uh, actually, I think it's a Harbor Freight version. What's next? All right. Um, Evan Askins says, hey, James, I'm restoring an old plane and can't get the lateral adjustment back onto the frog. Any suggestions? Oh, you took the lateral adjuster off. Ow. Yeah, don't ever take the lateral adjuster off. Um, <laughs> even the most diehard um, restoration people don't take the lateral adjuster off um, because it's riveted onto the, the, the cast frog. And usually to take it off, you have to destroy the rivet, which means you have to buy, make, a new rivet for it, um, which is kind of funny because there's a rivet on the frog. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I would have to know how you got it off to know how you can put it back on, because um, most of the time you end up drilling it out to get it off um, or um, destroying the head on the other side. Um, yeah, that's why Generally, you don't take the, the lateral adjuster off of the frog. Um, yeah, send me some pictures. I'd be glad to help you once I see what problem you're having with it. But uh, I guess that's about the best I can do right now. Sorry. <laughs> um, John Hayes asked, have you used an electric planer? Yeah. Yeah, I have a uh, I have a thickness planer. Um, I have a Triton uh, six inch handheld um, electric planer. Um, I don't use them very often, um, unless I'm working with rough cut lumber and I just want to get it down to dimension quickly. Um, then I'll run them through one of those. Um, I like using a, a handheld electric planer because it's basically the same as using a hand plane. Um, it's just faster. In most cases, it's, it's, it, it takes the place of the scrub plane. I get it close like I would with a scrub plane, and then I'll bring out my hand plane and detail it down. Um, unless I'm doing a lot of board feet, then I'll take it out and set up a thickness planer and, and go to it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I have used them quite a bit. My, my, I have still spent more time with power tools than I have with hand tools um, because I, I grew up power tools. Um, I did power tools for, what, 25 years? Um, from about five years old on. 30? Oh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you didn't use it as a baby. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, the first time I used a table saw, I was I've been five or six. Explains so much. Yeah. Um, Dad was there with me. I wasn't, you know, just like, go use the table saw, but Let's see. Um, I'm not sure how to say this one. Gazanked? So which tool chest is the lead so far as the choice for that project? Um, it's looking like I'm going to be using a, a joiner's um, tool chest with the sliding tills. Um, but I, I don't know yet. I have got five or six that have sent me emails. And I'm hoping this week to do some more contact with them and see which ones would be available. Um, but we'll see. Um, so something probably around 30 inches long, so I can get saws in it all the way, um, full full size hand saws, and then have enough space in the bottom for three or four um, metal hand planes. Um, but we will we'll see where that goes. What's next? John Hayes asked, what style furniture do you like, such as colonial, Victorian, Queen Anne, Gothic, etc., and what style are you into now? Oh, mission. Um, yeah, mission or arts and crafts. Um, that's craftsman. That, that style frame is, is by far my favorite. I love the, the simple lines, the joinery that's shown, um, just the, the simplicity of it. I really enjoy that. Um, I'm not much for the the, the frou-frou with lots of miter, with lots of uh, molding and uh, carving and details. Um, I do like some 
of the, the more uh, um, blocky um, Japanese style. I think that fits in very well. Um, they tend to be a little bit softer than I would like. Uh, I like a, a relatively harsh edge. Um, matches my personality. <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 the mission arts and crafts, craftsman style, that's uh, Frank Lloyd Wright. I love that. That's, that's where I want to go. That's where most of my furniture is shaped from. <laughs> you talk about being sharp edges, and I think of all of the uh, edges I run into every day. <laughs> like our bed frame. I think it's the most dangerous one in our house right now because the, what you call it, yeah, you have a coffee thin tables put side. away. Huh? You have a thin walkway on your side. I'm just a klutz. It doesn't matter how much <laughs> space you give me. <laughs> Um, David Walcott asked, ceramic or diamond stones for general woodworking? Diamonds, diamonds, yeah. Um, ceramics are just, they, they, they're great. They, they work well. They're just a lot of extra work and they make a mess. And they are great for you when you, when you want to zen out and enjoy the art of sharpening. And when you really want to slow down and, and polish it off smoothly, ceramics are amazing for that. Really, really beautiful. Um, but for just functionality and get it done, diamonds are the most utilitarian, functional, fast, 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 fast. Um, yeah. You, you can't beat them for utility. What's next? I'm caught up. You're caught up? I'm caught up. We're all done with questions? Cool. Um, cool. Well, that was actually fast. Um, next week, we're going to be working on the, um, the joinery window. And we are doing the drawbore tenon, so we're hoping to do that. Um, and actually, I want to talk to you guys and, and pick your brain a moment uh, because the the viewership on the lives has been going down and down. And so I'm thinking about reworking them um, once I'm done with the, the joinery window. And so part of me is thinking to do a live Q&A like this once a month rather than doing a live every week. Um, and then once every other month do a longer live where we actually have a build and I let people know ahead of time so they can get things and build along with me live. Um, I think that would be kind of fun. Um, and then in between, rather than doing a live on the day, um, do another video like I would normally do on a Thursday, which is a how-to um, or a tool talk or a demonstration, something of that nature. So I'm kind of interested to hear what your thoughts are because the uh, viewership on lives is... Um, kind of down so I don't know. let me know um oh they all just threw a bunch of questions <laughs> oh really well let's answer a couple more we got a couple minutes left um, when we yeah. run out we're done though <laughs> um <laughs> dr con asked any fun diving lately um i went last week uh, two weekends ago um went with my son trying out a new dry suit um I'm actually, this weekend, I'm going to be taking my youngest, um, and he's going to be doing his class to be certified. So hopefully at the end of that, all five of us will be fully certified. Um, so I've got a few summer dives I want to do. Um, in a couple weeks, I'm going to be going up to um, um, Mackinac and doing a couple dives up in the Mackinac area. So stay tuned. What's next? Um, let's see, John Haynes, John Hayes asked, have you built a project with no glue, no nails, like some Japanese style furniture? Oh yeah, we've gotten quite a few of those. Um, I did a, a slanted side dovetailed um, tool tray um, with a bent handle that was all joinery. Um, I've done quite a few that are all, all joinery. Um, and most of the things I build, I build them so I could do them without glue. Um, they are structurally sound. Glue is there as the backup. Um, I tend to find that to be the, the best way to build um, in, in normal. Um, and one of the reasons why the Japanese had a tradition of doing things without glue is because their glue was um, not as good. And it was, it, you just knew that it wasn't going to last. They had glue and they used it. Um, but if your work could work without glue, then great. <laughs> what 
What's next? All right, last question I have is Polly and Prague. Do you have a favorite wood to work with? And on the flip side, do you have a nemesis? Yes, white oak. Yes, hickory. <laughs> white oak is absolutely beautiful. Um, this one's red oak. Um, here. There, that one's white oak. Um, I love white oak. It's just, it, it, it's a pain to work with. It is not easy. Um, but it is very, very rewarding. It, it just has so much texture and so much energy to it and just going all over the place. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful wood. Um, I really, really like white oak. Um, on the flip side, hickory is everything that white oak is without the appearance. Hickory is difficult to work and splinterous and hard, just like white oak. But you get nothing for it. And you finish it and it looks blah. Um, which is why I trimmed my whole house in, out in hickory. <laughs> now I actually ended up staining the hickory to look like oak because I got such a good deal on hickory that I decided to use that. Um, but uh, yeah, that's where we're at. So my floors are white oak. The trim is hickory, but they look like they go together. <laughs> so uh, I think that will do it. So stay tuned for next time. We're going to be doing a drawboard tenon, and I think I'll do it for now. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.